going to be talking a little bit about um, a movement uh, that some of you may or may not have heard about, which is a bit of an offshoot of the decolonizing education movement, and particularly um, the decolonizing science movement. So before that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Chondri Maganguli, and I am a research fellow um, in cosmology at the University of Cambridge. So obviously, I am very, very um, engaged with the pursuit of science. And um, honestly, I call myself a scientific historian in a way, because uh, cosmology is a study of the origin of the universe. So to begin with, um, I'd like to ask you a question. According to you, let me have a show of hands. Is science objectively true? Wow. OK. OK, four, three, four people. Nice. Let's see if I can change your mind. Next question, do you think planes fly? I mean, I understand that this is a bit of a leading question because there is a picture of a plane that is clearly flying. But again, let's have a show of hands. Do you think planes fly? Yeah, most of you think planes fly. And most of the time, um, you'd actually be correct. But um, there are sometimes a few fatalities where planes don't fly. Um, about 140 planes between 2012 and 2016 didn't actually manage to fly. Um, so the statement that planes fly isn't exactly right. What I can say is that most of the time, and we can quantify this with statistics, planes do manage to fly. Now this is a bit of an obtuse example, right? Because um, I can actually look at the number of planes that are flying, I can count them, I can count the number of planes that don't fly, and I can give you a really good estimate of how likely it is that when you board a plane, you'll actually manage to arrive safely at your destination. This is an example a little bit of how we use statistics to understand um, experimental results or draw scientific theories or hypotheses and prove them. This method gets a little bit complicated when you apply it to certain questions that science seeks to answer. And one of the questions is the question that I research. That is, how did the universe begin? Now, the obvious problem with this, of course, is that unlike in my example of the planes, I can't actually do direct experiment or observation of the very beginning of the universe. What I have to do is that I have to assume a theory and assume that, that the laws that govern physics, in fact, physics as a paradigm itself remains valid right till today, and I have to infer results and figure out how the universe could have begun. Already this becomes a bit more of a complicated process because I'm assuming models, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming paradigms, I'm using a statistical model in order to verify my model given some data that is true today. So already, the scientific method that I'm using for simpler situations starts to become a little bit more less objective, if you like. So the question I just asked you was about whether science was objective. Science is not usually objective, but the problem I have is that the way we qualify good science, we use that as a synonym for objective science. And I actually think that's a problem in the way we communicate science from the scientific community to the non-scientific community. And so actually, I'm going to call, for a call to action any people who belong to the scientific community to be transparent about the science that we do and its possible limitations when we communicate it out to our broader community. And to those of you who uh, consider yourselves to be on the outside of the scientific community, I think it's important for you to investigate scientific claims and, it, and inform yourselves about its possible limitations. This, this concept will become really, really important in my next section because the next question I'm going to ask you is, who is a good scientist? Fun fact, I actually Googled good scientist and this was uh, one of the top hits. Um, in my worldview, if I could make the rules for this, um, a good scientist would kind of look like this. But um, unfortunately, I don't get to make the rules. And this is actually a problem because, as I'm sure most of you are aware, most scientific disciplines, definitely my discipline in theoretical physics and maths, is biased towards only a certain kind of person. 
So this sort of culture around this led uh, one of my colleagues, Chandra Prescott Weinstein, to write on her blog um, about the culture that permeates cosmology, and she calls it toxic masculine cosmology. Now the words to toxic and masculine don't only refer to the kind of people or how we populate the academic hierarchies within cosmology with cis white heterosexual men, but also the culture that permeates the science we do. You see, in my experience, the way we do science is that we try to push forward an idea of invulnerability, of being absolutely correct, of, of never showing weakness or ever showing a possibility of being wrong. But the point is that we don't even know what's right. Science is not objectively true. We are all subject to human bias. We're all subject to our cultural backgrounds as a scientist, as you will see later on in the talk. So what are we really pushing forward this imagined version of strength towards? Also, um, because of this idea of an objective truth that is put forward through science, we also have this idea of a meritocracy. Now, something that is considered meritorious is seen as something that is going closer and closer to this idea of objective truth as pushed forward by science. But as we just said, that's, that's objectively not true, if you'll excuse the pun. So why are we populating our ranks with this idea of meritocracy, which is in fact arbitrary? And the metrics that measure this merit are also created by, again, the majority of people who have populated the scientific ranks. Because of this, actually, the culture becomes extremely inhospitable. And this, in my opinion, leads to statistics like these, which are actually really awful when you think about it. This shows a number of Hispanic women and African-American women who were enrolled in astronomy degrees from 1997 to 2016 um, in American universities, a statistic published by the American Institute of Physics. There were less than 10 African-American women who were enrolled in bachelor's degrees in this between 2012 and 15. Now, I don't think we can combat this problem by just saying that let's have more m women of color, let's have more queer people doing astronomy. There's obviously this problem goes far deeper than just simple diversity. The culture has to be a culture of inclusion. Whereas if we keep holding on to these ideas of arbitrary objectivity, arbitrary merit, we will end up, by definition, excluding the majority of people. And to me, that is not a way that you can do good science. So my second call for action to the scientific community is to make hiring decisions, and not just within the academic ranks or industrial research ranks, but also when recruiting students, not just based on merit, because as we just said, that's a matter of decision and choice, but also are based on people who are truly committed to changing the culture in which we do science. Now, in order to progress with science, as I'm sure you will be hearing about more in the rest of this festival, we need a paradigm shift, particularly in the fields of theoretical physics. If we have only one type of person with a very limited view of, of, of the human experience, we will not be able to achieve this paradigm shift. Furthermore, the way we distribute power and privilege is in itself an exclusionary process. When someone gets a job, when someone gets into the university of their dreams, when somebody gets into a tenured position, there are lots of people who get pushed out based on this idea of merit. How are we ever going to build an inclusive scientific community unless we tackle the fact that hierarchical distributions of power themselves are exclusionary? So ultimately, my dream, I think, to have to build a more inclusive community is also disma dismantling hierarchical distributions of power. Ultimately, as a scientist, I think we're all here to try to understand nature better. And that is our great equalizer. So with that, I think what I am advocating for is a change in climate. I'm not advocating for increased greenhouse gas emissions. I think we have had enough of that. But we need to change the climate in which we not only discuss science within the community, but the way the larger community perceives scientists and science. I have no patience for constructing a, a deification of any institution. 
I do not think we should be deifying scientific institutions and saying things like, we believe in science. Science is not a matter of belief, it is a matter of question. And you must be skeptical of every claim that anybody makes, whether or not they have a bunch of scientific degrees or not. And only then, I think, as a community effort, can we actually move forward in making science a more inclusive and actually a place that is better able to contend with the challenges that are coming towards us from lots of socio-political and economic fronts. So with this, let me introduce the program of decolonizing. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at iai.tv.